Hi, I'm Janice Francisco, and I'm the founder of Bridgepoint Effect. We're an organizational development and innovation strategy company. We're based in Toronto, Canada, and we work globally with clients who want to collaborate, innovate, and work better together. And I am Sarah Thurber, managing partner at Foresight. We do research in publishing and training in the innovation space. Um, we're probably best known for publishing the Foresight Thinking Profile which is an assessment of creative cognition. So effectively, we're really a bunch of creativity nerds. Our partners have PhDs and Master of Science in creativity. And our mission is really to capture the valuable research in the field of creativity and transmit it to teams and organizations that are trying to create new value and growth at scale. And we're very excited about this study that we've done with innovators and Bridgepoint Effect. Can't wait to share the results. Okay, so first, let's uh, give you some context about what we're working to achieve on the webinar today. Uh, first, we're going to give you some background information and context on what spurred this research and how it actually came together. Uh, then, so that you'll understand the results when we share them, we need to give you some basic information about the Foresight Thinking Profile Assessment that Sarah just talked about and that we also used uh, in in conducting this study. From there, we're going to show you the results of the study and how, by leveraging a number of other research pieces that we had access to, um, we've been able to shed new light on why innovation seems to be so hard in organizations and, more importantly, what you can do to make it easier. So I'm going to start now with a little bit of a story. It's November 2017. I've just moved my company and myself to Toronto because we're scaling globally. And I find out that the Innovators Conference is in Toronto. Well, of course, I'm going to go. And when I get there, I actually hear um, a lot of very similar themes, whether it's from a speaker or a participant I'm talking to over lunch or over coffee. I'm hearing this. I'm hearing innovation is hard. Collaboration is hard. Nobody likes me. Everybody's giving me grief. And, you know, when you look at it, everybody's saying this sort of thing. They say, I've got this big innovation, but finance won't fund it. The engineering people don't want to talk to me or build it. IT has nothing to do with coding it. They don't want to talk to me about that. And the salespeople, they don't want to be selling it. And I realize that what I'm hearing is very similar to what I've actually been hearing from my own clients. And it strikes me that pretty well everyone who's working in innovation <laughs> is asking the same question. Why? If I'm so passionate about my ideals, do I feel so much resistance from the organization? Now, we'd had a bit of experience in guiding our own clients to help answer this question. And because I work so closely with for the Foresight team and the research that there's do they're doing, I realized that there was likely a missing link in the research that we all had that would actually allow us to answer that question. So when Hans came to me and asked if I'd be interested in speaking at the Innovators Conference, I saw a different opportunity. I suggested we bring Sarah in on the conversation and look at this phenomenon to see if we could offer some answers to this community. So in the end, when the three of us got together and talked about our big idea ourselves, we landed on the idea that what we needed to do was conduct a research study to find out who are the innovators in organizations and what might be the reasons that innovation stalls. So at this point, now you've got that, let me hand it over to Sarah and we'll get a little bit more background information. Cool, will you forward the slide for me, Janice? I would like to, but no. there we go. Okay, I'm working. <laughs> Thank you, you're good. Thanks, Janice. So we wanna make sure that when Janice and I are throwing around terms like creativity and innovation, that we've got a, a level set, that everyone's on the same page. So when we're using the term creativity, we are not referring to creative expression or the big aha moment or even big ideas. What we're referring to is the greater ability to generate novelty that's useful. So we're, we're drawing a big circle around the word creativity. Creativity 
is often from from the research we know it's often a phenomenon done by individuals or by small groups innovation by contrast is the effort to capture and scale the value of creativity that requires teams that requires cross-functional teams that requires organizations so the phenomenon of creativity while it happens in individuals and small groups is really in essence the front end of innovation we have a quote here from Teresa Mobley, our, our role model at, P, at uh, Harvard, who says creativity is the front end of innovation. Without, crea without innovation, there's no creativity. That's not true. Without creativity, there's no innovation. It's really what fuels the ideas and, and transition to create new value. Now, having said that, the other important level set, the other important place to be on the same page is creativity is not only about ideas and the famous person that said that was Janice who wanted to make the following point. So back to you. <laughs> okay. So um, the research that we've conducted and that Ford Foresight had started into is based on 65 years of research. Sarah said we're all creativity research nerds. Um, it's based on this research that has identified there is a universal creative process that everyone when faced with a challenge engages in. And the process looks like this. They clarify typically what the problem is, what, this, what the situation or opportunity is. They find some ideas to help solidify it. They develop those ideas and turn them into something that's workable and that'll actually live within the environment that they're in and work to get it implemented. And that's what we all go through in, as, we, as we go through this uh, process. Now, when Sarah was saying that creativity is many kinds of thinking, this is much of the research that Foresight found uh, in order to build this assessment that we've been using. And so creativity is four kinds of thinking. So yes, there's, it is about ideas, but there's a lot of creativity in clarifying what a problem is, developing a, a, a solution, and also getting it implemented. And what the research that Foresight conducted found was that people have preferences for engaging in that um, process. And more interestingly, that translates into teams. Teams have preferences for how they like to think and work and job functions also. So we're gonna be telling you a little bit more about that. Now, you can probably relate to this if you're engaged in innovation. So Sarah said, everybody looks at a problem differently, just much like they use their hands. Well, if you take a look at that great idea or new product or shiny new thing that you're trying to implement in an organization, you likely have taken it to different people and found that this is kind of some of the viewpoint. People look at things very differently, and yet it's exactly the same thing. So let's look a little bit more at the study and what we did. So in 2018, Sarah and I, with the Innovators team, traveled to four continents, six cities, and found over 400 corporate innovators at the Innovators conferences who were willing to complete the profile and give us the research data that we needed to, come to do this study. Now, once we got that all gathered, the researchers at Foresight took a big, deep look at it and they compared what we found to the 11 organizational functions, another research study that they had done that looked at how does innovation play out across functions and organizations. And just to make sure this was completely legitimate, they also took a snapshot of the general population of people who had completed a foresight thinking profile assessment in that exact same time frame in 2018. And we had over 13,000 people who had completed that at the time that we were able to do the comparative to. What we're proud to say is as a result, the three organizations have actually been able to build the first ever cognitive profile of innovators in organizations. And it answers a heck of a lot of questions around who we are and why we can't do it alone. And more importantly, it offers some hope and some really tangible solutions around what we can do about it to make innovation a lot easier. So I'm going to turn it over to Sarah right now because I think it's going to be great if we can get her to talk a little bit more about the profile itself. 
Thanks, Janice. Okay, so the reason we picked the Foresight Thinking Profile to do this study is that Foresight really measures how people engage in creative process. And of course, that's what we are doing when we're trying to innovate and what we're doing when we're asking people to bring innovation through an organization. Everybody's got to engage. So the, the, the profile itself is a pretty easy situation. There are 36 scored questions, takes 10 minutes to do, but what it shows is it shows where in the process your energy peaks and where it drops. It's not a measure of capacity. It's not a measure of ability. It's a measure of really energy. If you think about it, um, when I give you a pen and say, write your name really fast, you grab it with the hand that you naturally prefer. If I give you a ball and say, kick a goal, you kick it with the foot that you naturally prefer. If I give you a problem and say, go solve it, you grab it with the thinking style you naturally prefer. And that's a phenomenon that happens without consciousness. It just happens absolutely at an intuitive level, which is kind of cool. But what happens is because it's not conscious, we don't recognize that the way we do it is different than the way other people do it. And we blithely go along doing our job, assuming that the way we think about things probably is the way people think about things. Could not be farther from the truth. Um, can you give me the next slides? So in fact, what we find is when you measure people's preference for clarifying and ideating and developing and implementing, you'll find that 50% of the population has a single preference. They prefer one thing over the other. Implementers are our most common. 20% of people have two preferences. So they might be a combination of clarifier and implementer. And all of those combinations will sort of affect how people grab onto a problem and how they work through it. Um, it will also affect how they engage with other people who are working on the same problem and may or may not have the same profile. Um, what I wanna do in the next slide is sort of explain that I'm gonna go through each of the primary profiles. I'll talk you through um, what happens if you have a high preference for clarifying, we call you a clarifier. If you have a high preference for ideating, we call you an ideator, et cetera. So I'm gonna go through each of those four and give you sort of a background research so you've got bullet points to understand the overall research we're gonna go through um, a little more clearly. Now, when I'm doing that, I want you to listen for yourself, like, is this me? But I also want you to listen for, who is this like? If it's not like me, who is this like? So we start with clarifiers. Clarifiers really love the front end of the process. They love looking at a, a challenge, an opportunity, the, the landscape, and understanding what's happening, what's real, what's been done before. So these guys are fundamentally realist. They wanna get a clear picture of what is. And they wanna understand what is happening so well that they wanna understand where the problems are and specifically how to frame a problem. So if they take aim at it, they're gonna get a solution that points them in the right direction. So clarifiers love the problem space. Then we go to ideators. A little different, a little different in kind. Ideators are really not at all about the problem. They're not really that interested in the reality and the hard facts and the meticulous spreadsheets. They're really interested in the big picture, in the possibilities, in using their imagination to cast out new possibilities. They're also extremely drawn to, in, to uh, novelty and originality. They really like variety, they like new, they like making and seeing new connections. So a very different bird from the clarifier who's much more trying to, to approach a problem based on what do we know and what do we know from the past. Ideators are like what's possible and what could happen in the future. Okay, next slide. Then we go to developers. Remember this is the third diamond in that process where developers are the folks who really like to take an idea and then make the bridge from the idea, which tends to be a pretty rough abstract concept to the solution, which is something you can sell or move or make or do something with. So developers are really idea engineers. They like to take an idea 
And then they like to try to understand how they can make it real in the world. Um, you think of a bridge. A bridge is a perfect engineering job. Somebody's conceptualized we ought to have a bridge. Everybody wants to use the bridge. It's the, the developers who literally engineer the bridge all kind of conceptually and make sure it's going to work before it ever goes live. That's what developers do. Okay. And implementers, woohoo! Implementers are the just do it people. They're the people who are really inclined to action. They're the people who sit at a meeting and the whole time they're thinking, so what are we going to do? So what are the results? So what's the bottom line? So implementers are a big driving force in pushing things through the organization and getting things done. They tend to be really willing to jump into action and, and have a lot of confidence that we're going to learn as we go. Um, that's the, the specialty of the implementer. Okay, so now we have a quiz for you guys. Just All right, Hans, this is where you get to pull up our poll in just a second. Let Sarah explain it. Okay, so, so Hans and Janice and I made this poll to see how, how um, well you're listening. So what we want you to do is match the preference with the job function. This is the slide, this isn't quite the poll yet, but we're gonna show you these different job functions, innovation, finance, information technology, engineering, and sales, and give you a chance to guess what's the primary um, thinking preference of each of those jobs. Do you wanna try the poll, Hans? Let me do that. Okay. There he goes. Oh, I see it. It's working. It's a good thing we can't vote, Sarah. Oh, it's too bad. <laughs> I'm from Chicago, man. I vote early and often. <laughs> so I see the first votes coming in. That's great. Thank you. Keep them coming. All right. Hmm. Most people on the line are all most equal in their. How come I can't see right, the results? Actually, this is pretty impressive. How come yeah. I can't see the results? I oh, I can see the results. So I'll talk through the results, Janice. Okay. No, I'm, I'm, just I'm, maybe wait a couple of seconds. Wait, wait a minute. A few more it. seconds, and I'll and I'll uh, shift it to the next slide when you're ready, Sarah. Let me say you guys are doing great. Okay. All right. Can we let's get a couple more votes in? Darn, I wish I could see this. I don't know why. Oh, you would love it. it. Be so proud. I don't want to hit any buttons because last time I did, I messed up the slide. So okay. <laughs> I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna keep driving. <laughs> All right, are we well, ready wait. to switch to results? So I end the poll, yeah. Sarah. Yeah, I think we can end. Do you want me to hit end poll? You got it. Oh, good. You can, can other can everybody see that? I'm, uh, I'm going to share the results if you want. You can see it. Okay, okay, there we are. Oh, look at that. Okay, so everyone can see that? Good. Okay, okay. so I'll talk you cool. through this. First okay. of all, well done. You guys are great. Um, it is true that based on the research, what we find is that ideators tend to have a very high preference, I'm sorry, innovators Oops. tend to have a very high preference for um, ideation. So our innovation is a match for ideators. You guys were 83% on that. And the truth is, you were also right. There are some innovation folks who are clarifiers and developers and implementers. This is not, you know, this is not pick one and only one. So um, actually your results were really good. Uh, innovation is a match with ideators. Finance is definitely a match with clarifiers. Um, we also find develop, they have a, a, some propensity for developing and implementing, but very low preference for ideation. So you were on that. Um, looking at the match for IT and engineering. Um, let me just make sure. Oh, you can't, can you guys see, you can see the results? Yes? Yeah. I just want to make sure when I'm talking through, you can see what I'm seeing. So with number three, IT and engineering both match to developers. That's true. Um, thanks, Natalie. I'm glad you can see. Um, and then for sales, it's also true that um, implementing is the strongest one. You guys did an awesome job in, in sort of guessing that whole piece. All right, so this is what the matches are. 
And when you go to the next slide, here's what we found. Here's what the, the results of taking the Foresight profile and looking at hundreds of thousands of profiles and matching them with our demographic data, this is what we find. What you're looking at in this slide is a, a compilation of Foresight profile by job function. So in each of these boxes, you'll see, for instance, on top, consulting. They'll be on the top left. Consulting has sort of that four point graph. Each of the points measures the preferences in order. So the point on the left measures preference for clarifying. The point just next to it is the measure. The peak point is measured for ideating, then developing and implementing. So these four point graphs measure each of the assessment, each of the um, stages in the assessment. So what you can see also is that while we have thinking profiles for consulting and advertising and finance, et cetera, we were missing a profile for innovators. And that was really the impetus for working with the Innovators Conference and coming up with like, who are corporate innovators? Okay, Janice. So this is what we found. We, inter we, we gave the assessment to 410 participants, as Janice said, and our PhD guys were like, no, you can't just do it in, in isolation. You have to do it against the general population. So we did compare it to 13,000 um, of the general population. And what we find clearly is that while the general population in green has a nice even balanced approach to problem solving, that's really not the case with our innovator audience. Innovators have a low pref lower than average preference for clarifying. Not so interested in what are the numbers, what's the reality, what can't be done. No, forget it. Their interest is in ideation. Like what are the possibilities? What could we do that's new? How can we make new connections to bring something new? Again, an energy dive when it comes to developing, like how do we how do we engineer this solution so it's perfect in the system that we have and with the, the customers that we are gonna get it, uh, but an energy increase in let's make it, let's do it, let's try it out. So overall, the way to read this profile of innovators in blue is innovators by and large are people who fall in love passionately with their ideas and wanna make them and really can't quite understand all the resistance coming at them from all sides. So that's where we landed. And when you go to the next slide, you'll see when you tuck that finding in with the rest of the sort of stained glass window of who else is in the organization, you can see that innovators is a pretty distinctive profile. It kind of matches some and it's kind of the opposite of others. And that's what I want to go through and show you because what we know is the jobs have certain cognitive demands and people who like that type of cognition tend to be attracted to that type of job. So this is not happening in just one organization. This wasn't one study that happened one year. This is an organizational phenomenon. This is in every organization. Even in my office, our bookkeeper, a clarifier. You know, our salesperson, an implementer. Our IT guys, developers, and we didn't pick them for their profile. We could have, but we didn't. Um, and we don't, we pick them for their expertise, but it turned out that their profiles by and large match their expertise. So in all likelihood, this phenomenon is happening in your organization right now as well. So let's go to the next slide and see who is compatible with the, uh, the innovators, right? this sort of shape of this line with such a high peak in ideators, the other people in the organization that are like-minded, literally like-minded, are consultants, advertising, design. We also know from our research, top executives tend to have a peak in ideation because they have to do big thinking and visionary thinking. Um, we also find that entrepreneurs have a peak for ideation and implementation. So those are the folks in organizations that are that are not versus uh, innovators. Those are the folks that are very, very compatible in general. Probably not a surprise to you guys, but look who's, who's versus. So 
these are the groups in organizations that just cognitively do not share the innovator cognitive disposition. Finance, operations, quality, engineering, IT, purchasing, sales. Oops, these are the people who fund, build, run, approve, code, and buy and sell your new idea. That's a problem. That's a big problem. Janice? Okay. You're next. All right. So here's what I like about Foresight in helping to solve that problem. How do we help people understand who they are in that innovation process and what they can contribute in the organization to make innovation come through? And so when I first start introducing Foresight to clients, one of the first things they say to me is, wow, this is just so much more than assess an assessment. Because as soon as you understand who you are and how you think in the process, you start to have the code to how to unlock how you talk to and work with other people in the organization. And you learn where you might have your blind spots so you can flex your thinking and learn to think in new ways so that you can meet people where they are. And so one of the things that Foresight offers is a really great language to help do that. So we talk a lot about that when we do the trainings. We thought it would be fun to take some of the basic differences that we experience. And if you start to attune yourself to this, trust me, the next time you go to a meeting, you're going to be able to peg out who's what. And you're going to start to see this quite intuitively. But let's look at this from the lens of you as an innovator, where you're attempting to sell your big idea into the organization. So let's look again more concretely at what it is that innovators like to talk about. So you know what? They're focused on their fresh, new, and exciting ideas. They have raw ideas that haven't been thought through. The analogy I like to do is they're looking at trees in a forest and they're looking at all the opportunities. And they're very passionate and idealistic about you know, they talk about the stuff that they're very passionate and idealistic about. At the same time, they're very focused on telling you how they can make things better by doing something new and different. They talk about their vision for the big future. And of course, they're talking in abstract terms. It's a very big picture. It's conceptual. And why aren't you getting it? Now, an idea you're going to talk to a clarifier is going to need to understand that the clarifier's focus is, I want to know uh, what's the problem you're solving? What's the precedent? What's the best practice? They are going to want to know how does, you, how does what you're doing connect to the strategy and priorities we've already set out in this organization? They're certainly going to want to know, so have you done your research? Are you organized? Don't come to a clarifier in a very disorganized fashion. And more importantly, they're going to want to know, so have you done any thinking on this? Have you thought it through? What's the reality here? They want you to come with some of that. Now, if you're approaching a developer, they're going to want to know, how does your idea fit into the larger organizational system? They want the specs. They don't want your big concept idea. They, they don't want to talk about trees. They want to know, how are you going to move to milled lumber so they can build something? So you've got to be able to translate that big concept into something real to show them the steps they're going to have to take to actually do it. They're going to want clear instructions from you on what they're expected to be doing. And guess what? They want it at a granular level of detail. They're also going to want to know, so what's the plan? What are your timelines? What are the milestones we have to hit? Because they're going to try to be figuring out to engineer that bridge for you to make that all happen. Implementers, here's what they're going to be asking of you. They want to know the bottom line. Don't talk in big concepts. End of the day, what are the results? What are the deadlines? What needs to be done by when? Who's going to be doing it? And what is it that exactly that you will be doing? You know, they'll often say to you, so what do you want me to do? Now, we've got a little bit of time. We're going to spend uh, a few minutes here. Uh, we've got a question for you. And we're wondering, have you seen this happen in your organization? Maybe you can use the chat window. We're going to give you about 30 seconds to make some um, responses. And just to make it a little bit more fun, I'm hoping I can play this Jeopardy quit with the music. So what's your <laughs> comments and your experience of this in the organization? Right. So type into the chat if you've encountered any of this phenomenon in your organization or trying to move innovation through the organization. Um, 
and then we'll also do uh, ask some people to raise hands um, and share experiences like that. <laughs> yes, definitely. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so it would be great as you as you write your experiences in chat. Also, think of like what you might share um, to sort of help people understand. Uh, specific instances of this in your organization or that you've encountered. Does everyone know how to raise hands in this? If you go to um, participants, if you click on the participants, you can raise your hand. It looked like somebody did raise their hand. Was it Michael? I gotta look at the attendees. So, there's a one, there's a hand raise from Suzanne. Suzanne, you wanna unmute and share something from this, from your experience? Hang on, you, oh, I gotta allow you to talk. All right, try it now. Um, we had a clarifier in our organization who was um, really talented, but our staff meetings were run in such a way that a lot of times like new ideas or things would change during the meeting and people thought that she was just a naysayer because whenever ideas, new ideas came up, she had this series of questions that she really needed to have asked. And so um, once people kind of understood that that's what she was trying to do was to clarify and we had that language, it really released a lot of tension that we had in the organization. That is super helpful. I have to tell you on a personal level, my husband is a clarifier and I'm a low clarifier. And I, you know, he would, he was always identifying problems. And I just thought he was really negative, literally until we did this uh, work together. Of course we founded the organization, so I was lucky we did. I think we must've done it to save the marriage. But um, you know, when, we, when I understood he's a high clarifier, he's identifying problems. And if we address those problems, those problems are gone. You know, I'm always good at accommodating problems and working around problems, but you know, his clarifying impulse really helped him address, helped us address them and put them away. So I think what you're saying is, is what I find both on a personal level and an organizational level, the ability to recognize that somebody's impulse to help solve the problem may literally feel bad to you but be a huge, huge asset if you can overcome that initial sort of limbic response of like, oh, that's so negative or, you know, you're doing it wrong. Um, people can come to the table and really contribute important things. Who else had a hand raise? I can't, I'm not sure if I was sure. Can what? you see there, Sarah? I can, oh wait, I just saw it. Okay. Hang on. I'm back in. Uh, Katie. Katie Webb. Let me unmute you. Let me allow you to talk. There. Katie, can you? Oops. Oops. Oh, go Sorry, guys. No, I think we might have just accidentally touched the music again. It's okay. Oh. Perfect. Katie, can you, um, can we hear you? I am not able to hear you, but I can see you. Are you there? All right, Katie. I'm not able to, can anyone hear Katie? I can't hear you. All right, I'm gonna keep going in hopes that um, we can find. Oh, Katie just said that her microphone is not working. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Darn. We can't hear you if your microphone doesn't work. All right. Well, let's look at the chat. Okay. There's definitely some instance of people saying they've seen this. Uh, John, John Peluso, do you want to share what you were talking about? Can I find you and unmute you? Sorry, this participant thing is tricky. Uh, let me get John unmuted. I gotcha. All right. 
John, do you want to, would you mind sharing what you were talking about in the chat? Sure. I'm happy to talk. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So this is at a former company um, where I was the innovation lead and we were doing, um, for every person who went through uh, creative problem solving training, uh, they did the foresight test. So after a couple of years, I had a decent database, about 200 people. So I was able to pull that together and put together averages to see, you know, what the profile of the organization was. And it was very high on implementation and relatively low on ideation. And this explained to me why we were having a lot of difficulty coming up with uh, diverse and creative ideas to drive our new product development pipeline. Okay. okay. Super helpful. And, and you know, John, that sort of overall profile, we see a lot that organizations, once they've established the new idea and sort of set their um, standard operating procedures around it, they tend to, they tend to flatten out on the ideator and, and begin to suppress the ideator because the ideator tends to be disruptive, always wants something new, want variety. They don't like running, they don't like the rinse and repeat of an organization that's trying to iron out uh, kinks and, and really move toward, just move toward profitability. So, you know, I th thank you for sharing that. Super helpful. Um, Judy a, Bernstein, I saw, oh, go ahead. Jim. There's one person who talked about the fact that they've also seen ideators though, or innovators, uh, a uh, Wim van der how wheel, am I saying that right? Says that I see innovators in all departments, IT, legal, finance. And I think we should maybe comment on that. Well, let me answer Wim's question from before. He um, asked a question in, or you asked a question, Wim, in the uh, Q&A box, which was when we're talking innovators, who are we talking about? What we're talking about for this study is the 410 innovators that we measured are all people who registered for the innovator conference. So, you know, we do not have specs on their specific roles or anything like that. What we have is much more um, that we know they have a, a profound interest in organizational innovation because they registered for this conference and they took the assessments. So that's when we're talking innovators, that's our pool. Um, but I've unmuted you. Do you want to see if we can hear you? Well, Uh -oh, no, nope, he's right. not. He's not unmuted, Sarah. Oh, I didn't. All right, I'm trying. I'm clicking on mute and it's not working. I'm so sorry. Oh, your mic doesn't work. Okay. Well, Wim, thank you for your question. And um, I think yes. I let me let me take a stab at answering that also from another perspective. Yes. Hopefully, this helps, Wim. Wim. So yes, we will see people with a high ideation profile. Again, we're talking about the fact that we there's a there's a trend towards certain thinking preferences in different job functions. It doesn't mean that you won't see somebody with a different profile in those job functions. So I think we need to be cautionistic around the fact that we can't make an assumption that if they're in that function, they're going to definitely have that profile. It does though help us understand where people are coming from if we understand the language that they are using, we can start to tease out where their preferences might lie simply because of the behaviors we observe when we're meeting with them or doing things. And so, yes, there will be people engaged in innovation coming from all across the organization. Um, we do run into challenges though when people have difficulty kind of making the bridge or making that shift to meet people where they are so that they can do that collaboration because we all tend to like to be and do what we have a preference for doing right you don't tend to pick up uh, a pen and use your opposite hand just because um, you still kind of go to your default action so this becomes a much more conscious effort in making sure that we're understanding where we are in the process and what's the kind of thinking we need as well as what is what are the kinds of thinking we need to bring to the table at that particular point so we do have to have some flexibility there um, 
Thanks for that. And, and I want to jump to a Q&A, another question that came through about uh, speaking to the, the question is, hello, would you be able to speak to the integrator profile in terms of innovation? So for those of you who are not familiar with the foresight assessment, of the 15 profiles, there's only one profile that doesn't show preference or bias for one stage over another. It's called the integrator profile. And it's a profile where all of the scores fall within a small band. So they're, you know, rather than swinging from, oh, I love this and I hate this, people with an integrator profile, and they're about 17 or 18 percent of our database has an integrator profile, they have an even preference across the, uh, the entire creative process. And what we find there is people with that profile tend to do bridging fairly well. They tend to um, see everything that needs to get done because they don't have a prejudice. They, they literally don't have the gravitational pull of going toward one type of problem solving. They sort of are able to step back. They're able to see the whole scope of what has to get done. And they're able to recognize where people are failing to attend, failing, failing to move to the next stage or skipping a stage. So they tend to be really important in recognizing gaps and helping to fill them and helping to make sure the integrity of the problem solving process is, is um, good and strong throughout. They also tend to be more relationally focused. So in an innovation situation where we know there's sort of fundamental cognitive antagonism between departments that should be working together, an integrator could really be helpful there. Their risk is that they tend not to put themselves forward. They tend not to insert themselves aggressively into situations. They tend to be more um, recessive. And the challenge for them is to recognize, hey, we're not communicating with finance or we haven't got the specs that uh, that IT needs. Um, we, you know, and encouraging everybody else to step up. And if I may expand on that, Sarah, just to give another uh, little bit of insight, what was interesting is while the uh, results of this study showed there was a definite peak preference for ideators, for people who are identifying in corporate innovation, um, just because we do this as researchers, we started looking at, so how many clarifiers did we get? What happened with the, you know, what about the developers? Uh, you know, what, what sort of incidents did we have with implementers? And where were the integrators in this study? And just as an aside, we found that there was a consistent to the general population. Um, I think you said there's about 17 percent, Sarah. Uh, we found roughly the same thing happening across this population of innovators that we profiled, um, where they had that preference. So um, it also helped to further, you know, show that the statistics and the data that Foresight's been collecting over, what, more than 20 years, Sarah, um, are holding true, even when we're drilling into a specific uh, population. So I think that was really good. Um, should we move on, or is there another one to look at? I think we have, uh, man, we're kind of getting close to the end, Sarah. Maybe close. one more quick. Okay. Um, I actually saw a comment from Rita Baker. Rita, would you be, if, if I can figure out how to unmute you can, if, and your microphone? Uh, I'm not sure. How about Judy? Judy, I'm going to allow you to talk because you were, you made a comment in chat that was, that was uh, relevant to what we're talking about. Are you there, Judy? I am. Can am I yeah, audible we can to people? Uh, yeah, I had the pleasure of switching, trying to investigate switching my insurance, uh, and had to talk to a health insurance broker earlier this morning, and it, it was like we were speaking two different languages. I just wanted the big picture <laughs> as the early bird I am, you know, which is better and <laughs> and why, uh, you know, bottom line it for me. And he was trying to get across details that I, I didn't even want to understand. Um, so we had a, <laughs> it would have been, it would have been comical to everyone on this webinar, but it was not to the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> 
You know, it's interesting. Thanks, Judy, for sharing that. It's interesting because, you know, this stuff doesn't just show up at work. It also shows up in our personal life because these preferences carry with us. You know, there's consistency with it. So um, here's my own little story. You know, we travel all over the world and I, we have a team of people who goes. And what's really interesting is we all know what our foresight profiles are and we all travel in a different way and we need to learn how to do it. Now, I'm an integrator. So when I pack, I pack every outfit for every day into a huge Ziploc bag. And it is all completely organized. I clarify what I need. I generate ideas on it. I pack it in and I develop. Did I remember the jewelry? Do I have the underwear? Like seriously, folks, it's all there. And it's all implemented to the point that we, you know, zip it up and label it with what, what it is supposed to be because I don't want to show up without the stuff I need. And yeah. if I'm going to be doing, you know, a repeat of a piece of uh, outfit, you know, we'll even put a little post-it note saying use the jacket from my Monday or wash the jacket today because you need to know it the other day. Well, you know, we've traveled with an ideator and <laughs> this ideator showed up with the biggest freaking suitcase that all of us, right? Three weeks, we're all on the road for the little bit of stuff, but it's all packed and organized. And the ideator came with the biggest suitcase and all of this stuff literally on... <laughs> Literally, literally on hangers, okay, and unloaded the hangers out of the suitcase and had 17 shirts and five pairs of pants and all of these things. And believe it or not, five pairs of sunglasses. We were going to be working inside most of the time. But it was like, I need options. And I don't want to think and, and kind of pack it all in. I want to make sure that I have options when I get there. So uh, I think Sarah's had experience with her own family and some of the things when the siblings get together and plan, uh, people buying houses it plays out in many different ways. And when we understand what that code is, it starts to make it a lot easier to go, now, this is what I need, and can you please talk to me in that way? And so, Well, can I just on? pitch in and say that while it's, it, it is uh, it true and hilarious that um, it is really tough to overcome uh, thinking preferences and to... Um, you know, they don't go away. It, it's not, this is not one of these situations where you just put a mix of people in a room and hope for the best. Recent research that any of those of you who are exposed to foresight will appreciate just came out last year, which was measuring how people get along and who likes to work with whom. And what we found is that clarifiers really like to work with other clarifiers. They trust them. They like the way they think. They also will tolerate developers. Developers like developers. They can tolerate clarifiers too. Implementers, they only like implementers. Ideators, they like everyone, but no one likes working with them. So, <laughs> you know, it, it is the kind of thing where we are so locked into what we do and the only way to overcome it is to raise awareness and for everybody to raise awareness and just flag when this happens. Like, well, I think I was overdoing it on the ideation. If that ever gets troublesome for you, flag it for me, I'll rein it in. Because we all have the capacity to do all of it. You know, everybody, this is having an assessment and having it say, oh, I'm an ideator, does not give you a ticket to just do ideation. The whole point is, it gives you a ticket to take responsibility for the fact that you like to do ideation. And from there, it's yours to pivot, like I'm talking to a clarifier, I've got to make this conversation work for that person. And this little cheat sheet that Janice has put together, I think is one of the best versions of that I've ever seen for the innovation space. And Janice, I just want to compliment you on that. I think it's great. Thank you, Sarah. Well, it's really good when you've got research to work from and good clients who let you understand what's going on. So let's wrap up. Um, I'm going to see if I'm driving properly here. One second. I've got to close down something. Okay. There we are. Okay. Listen. Um, if you want to find out more about some of the other research that underpins this, um, you know, the net of this is this. Teams who have a foresight thinking preference awareness as well as process awareness outperform teams who don't. We have many research studies that have shown that, whether they're independent or ones that we've been doing with our own clients. And, you know, when you look at this foresight framework, really you can think about it from the standpoint that it becomes 
a universal framework. So yes, it's helping you understand how you're engaging in creative process, which is what innovation is. It is very much a creative process. And when we first started working with our clients to this, we were certainly using it as an innovation process. When you dig more deeply down into what makes teams effective, how do people work better together, and you start to understand that a large part of a team's role is to problem solve and make decisions so they can advance their goals. Um, what Foresight starts to offer, and certainly we've seen it with our own clients, is a really structured approach to be able to do that problem solving and make the decision making. But here's the thing that got me goosebumps when I started to really work in organizations where they were having difficulty in that whole cross-functional thing. So imagine going into a team who has to move innovation through the organization and they know they're not going to be doing it unless they collaborate and get everybody on board. And they've been really unsuccessful and frustrated in being able to do that over the previous time. And when we came in and started working with the leaders in the team and started to understand what was happening, we showed them how to use Foresight as a process to collaborate and engage other people. And when we did debriefs with them, they came back to us and said, you're not going to believe what happened. We've got other leaders in the organization saying to us, what did you do with your people? They're actually enjoyable to work with. They're listening to us. We want to work with them. And that's when this, these sorts of people that we were working with started to realize that there was much more to this than an innovation process and a problem solving. It really is universal. It, once people understand how this works, and as Sarah says, they know how to do that pivoting and think through different perspectives, they've got a structure, they've got a process to actually help them do that and collaborate and think better together. And so we're really excited to be able to bring this to the innovators community. Um, for me, this is work I've been doing since 2002, more, more uh, recently uh, since 2007 with teams. And it's just so nice to see that we can build on the foundation of the research and offer something tangible so that we can do a much better job than saying innovation is hard, collaboration is hard, you know, and we can give people some hope in ways that they might be able to think about that problem a little differently and bridge some of those gaps in the way that they're, they're collaborating in their organizations. So with that, I think we're about to sign off. Anything else you wanted to say, Sarah? Put that last slide on. So if people want your uh, contact information, Janice, they can get it, and, and mine as well. Um, we are super passionate about this research. I admit I'm an eye eater. I'm really passionate about this research. So if you want to talk big picture, you can, or if you want to ask details, I'll, I'll try to manage those as well. But Janice has a, a tremendous litany of, of ways to help people engage in this. And I think we'd be happy to share that slide in particular. If you want to write your email in chat, we'll share that slide about how to, how to speak across, um, across the organization. And Hans, we would like to say thank you. Thanks for coming to us. Thanks for believing in the big idea that we had. Thank you for helping us find a way to develop it and implement it and sticking with us as we all learned a heck of a lot in this community as we did it. Um, so now who knows where we'll go with this, but uh, it's been really nice to do this with you and your organization. Thank, thanks for saying that, Janice, and also Sarah. I mean, I have to thank you as well, and I also have a complaint, but I'll get first to the thank you. Uh, the thank <laughs> you is indeed for, for, for working with us in the community and traveling, uh, uh, let's say, to all four corners of the globe to, you know, to get this research done. And, and the insights, and that's the complaint, the insights were so obvious and evident. Um, when you shared them in Miami, um, you know, there were so many, like, aha, dropping on the floor that there's all kinds of... Uh, holes there and you know we're still we're still in contact with the venue about all the you know impact that it had but, uh, it's a joke that, um no thanks thanks really for for all the work you've done with the community it's really appreciated thank you thank you all right thanks Fun very much enjoy today. the rest of the summit folks <laughs>